Welcome to another episode of this webinar series with Strength and Condition Education, where we're talking to a variety of coaches in different sports about strength and conditioning and the impact it's had on their coaching career and in, in their sport. Today, we're delighted to welcome Emma. Um, Emma is a former junior GB triathlete. She's also been a pilot driver for British Cycling and is now running her own business as well in, in this area as well. Emma, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. It's, it's, it's great to speak to you. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. No, no problem. Let's let's get straight into it then. Just tell us a little bit more about you then, your journey, what you're currently doing, um, who you're currently supported, and then we'll go from there. Yep. Um, so currently working with a whole host of athletes from recreational up to those chasing sort of the home nation skin suit, which is great. It's a really nice range to have and um, to be able to work with. Um, and incorporating, incorporating triathlon training alongside strength and conditioning, or I should say strength and conditioning training alongside triathlon training to support them with their development and achieving their goals in the sports. Um, for me, I have been in the sport for, and in the fitness industry for about 14, 14 years now, I think it is. Um, yeah. And yeah, work for from a range of face to face moving more into the remote side of things in the last few years um and just recently started up the uh, built to endure linked um or partnered with strength and conditioning education coaching ed for um multi-sport for endurance sport athletes and coaches to upskill themselves um on strength and conditioning for endurance purposes because it is different to other sports like our field sports or contact sports um and because the needs are so different, we need strength conditioning, which supports that. Great. No, that's great. Yeah, it's obviously had a, had a big impact, not only in your coaching career as well, but I'm sure in, in, in previous as well. What? Let's get a little bit more in detail about S&C then in terms of, number one, you as an athlete, but then also number two, you as a coach and how much impact that's had on what you're currently delivering and how that's potentially changed over the years. Yeah, I think the biggest change has been, so when I first started out, there wasn't really any S&C around or definitely not as open and as available as it is nowadays and spoken about. Um, and then you'd look in, so I'd read cycling books or I'd read triathlon magazines and it would almost, unfortunately, it's a lot of the myths that we're battling. Oh, we just need to go and do high rep, low load or body weight exercises only. And that was sort of the that was the common trend. That was what you did. And then you might only do that in the winter once your season's finished and you don't want to go outside and train as much <laughs> as the weather's not as nice, um, which yeah is another battle. But unfortunately, <laughs> we are still fighting quite a lot of those myths um, even to today. And consequently, for my own training, I, I've had so many injuries. I've had a broken back. I've had a really head replacement in my elbow. Um, and I was just training, training, training. And I know there's other things, obviously, that influence that. So you've got the nutrition side of it and, you know, your pillars of athleticism. But a big thing for me was I'm, I'm getting knocked off of my bike in, in crit racing, for example, um, or just at the moment it's facing all of the potholes out there. But <laughs> I needed some, you know, I'm just not going to break as much. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I think when I got, I was training for the long course, um, Ironman to, to for GB good friend in Amsterdam. I, I think it was Almeria's off the top of my head. It's gone. I got knocked off my bike, ended up with a broken hip, and I thought, oh gosh, something yeah. needs, well, it needs to change a little bit now. And been in the fitness industry and had thought, right, and then you know, what can I do? How can I move forward with this? And then spoke to quite a few coaches, um, and then looked at what was happening because I think a lot of the time we have that. As coaches, we almost take that research approach of, well, the science paper that I've read says that and the supports that, but actually that scientific paper could be done five years ago. So we're already five years behind. So then it was like, well, what are the what are the athletes doing? And then, you know, luckily with the internet, you can see people like Mo Farah, um, and you can see they've got their training regimes. He put it up on YouTube, and you know, taking a deeper dive, you think, oh gosh, the pros, the pros are lifting weights. Yeah. But then think in your head, well, hold on a minute. How's he, you know, it's all of those myths that you've just sort of been spoon fed in as an endurance sport that, oh gosh, you don't want to lift heavy weights because you're going to grow really big. You're going to have that really hypertrophic effect. Yeah. And your, your muscle size is going to be an extra weight, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then it's like, well, 
Mary Farah certainly doesn't look like yeah. she's carrying there any at the time. So it was kind of like, right. And yeah, ever since I then went even further to SNC on a personal level, um, upskilled myself, did the coaching qualification. And then I was like, I haven't had an injury since, you know, I've been unfortunate yeah. to come off bike a few times in crashes or, you know, what it's like out there sometimes, but touch wood, nothing since. And that, to me, that's all attributed to the strength conditioning work I'm doing to support um, the the triathlon training or, or the on bike training or the running training. And then I've come back and, you know, I've run ultras and that side of things, Right. which if you tell people, you know, five years ago I broke my back they'd be like what do you mean you're getting an, 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 an ultra marathon kind of thing it's almost like wow and then what's really nice is not just about me is that that's what I see in the athletes that I coach right. most of the time unfortunately you see people and they say oh, I'm injured or I've yeah. had an injury I've had a really bad injury it's almost like we're always playing catch up um and then being able to take those athletes on that journey that then they're able to get back to what they love to do and not even just staving away from injuries but then also absolutely going out and pbs or prs or having that great feeling and equaling what they did 10 years ago um because they're doing strength and conditioning work to support it yeah and using that as an opportunity eh, to be able to it's a time to be able to drive those performance goals as well as just getting back exactly what you've said there okay that's great and then in terms of um running and cycling performance then are there any kind of key physical characteristics that you look to develop specifically within those two two domains that with the athletes that you're working in working with sorry um so i work off of a joint by joint approach and super six movement patterns where um it's not just about the lower limbs or it's not just yeah. about the lower body and the importance of the upper body to support that endurance economy so the running economy or cycling economy and also to really challenge um, those positions that we hold, because that's ultimately what's so different about endurance sports to other sports is that on the bike, you're slammed in that TT position for, you know, in an Ironman, maybe six hours yeah. um, or, or more or less, but, you know, six hours or so. And then if you're not doing anything to challenge that, it's like if you're sat at an office all day, you yeah. often see people slightly more hunched over shoulders because they've got stimulus to challenge us sort of the analogy I use quite a lot um but then to expect you know in a duathlon somebody to go and sort of run off of the bike or run bike run or you know whatever way you're looking to do it when they've just spent in a yeah. middle distance duathlon a long time in that hunched over position then it's not going to be comfortable it's going to affect their results um it's going to affect their recovery outside of the sport as well so yeah it's definitely it's, it's breaking down those those movements and thinking that it isn't the legs obviously are super important but it, we need to produce power and if you're over rocking in the torso you've got too much rotation in your torso on the bike that could be you know your pelvis is moving too yeah. much and then you're going to seep the power that should be in the pedals um outwards and then likewise if you're running we don't want too much torso um torso rotation there because it's just we're just wasting energy and I think that becomes even more apparent the further we go into the sport. So the more competitive you get or the more distances that you're chasing because you're putting such more stress on the body in those times. Yeah, yeah. And it's just being open minded, isn't it, to the bigger picture of that. Exactly what you've said there. That's great. And then in, in terms of the actual sport, then have you seen changes over recent times? Have you seen a shift towards um more interest in physical development and how people are doing it how's that kind of looked over the last few years within the sport yeah I definitely say there's now a momentum towards oh okay yeah we want to I know we need to start lifting weights now um unfortunately I can mention a lot of the times it is people coming to you with oh I've had this injury or yeah. I keep getting injured and then you've got a really great endurance training plan or triathlon training plan but it's so interrupted if because you're getting injured three or four times a year whereas if you could Re reduce that risk because that's what we're trying to do we can never guarantee injury prevention yeah. um, with strength conditioning training but we're trying to reduce that risk down then your training is going to be so much more consistent throughout the year um, so I think there's definitely a shift towards oh yeah I know I need to start when the athlete's ready to lift weights when you know when they're when they're ready for that but I think there's so many sort of cookie cutter plans online yeah. where 
it's like a generic training plan it doesn't fit in with your lifestyle it's you could have the best training plan in the world but if you've got you know you work nine to five monday to friday and then you've got kids to look after and you've got travel yeah. and it, it's just not possible it's not feasible um but for strength and conditioning it's almost like we want to run before we can swim yeah and well that was a good uh, analogy that was a good yeah. point. <laughs> <laughs> swim, no pun intended swimming <laughs> Yes, um, but no, it's it's what we want to jump in with those sort of more sexy exercises when actually yeah. we haven't earned that right yet, and that doesn't mean that we won't get there, but it's the, and this is where the what built to endure has been born out of is that strength and conditioning in itself is one thing, but strength and conditioning for endurance purposes is different because the the sports are different um, compared to your football, your rugby, so we need something that that, res- that respects that and and reflects it as well um yeah. so yeah yeah that that makes sense i think two things really stood out there from what you said and one was doing the basics really well and avoiding all the sexy stuff like you said and then the other one i think that's really key from what you're talking about is that earn the right to progress i think that's massive if you start to go towards that uh, too high end if you like then those injuries are going to still going to keep happening whereas if you get your basics right you get your foundations of movement right with the six pillars that you were talking about that's only going to help you one from injury prevention and two from a performance standpoint and absolutely and I think a lot of the time and even the coaches I speak to about this and the athletes there's that hesitancy of oh but I don't want to be sore I'm going to go and lift weights and then then that's going to ruin my training for the rest of the week which yeah will 100% there's nothing worse than not being able to walk up and down the stairs because you've gone and worked too hard in the gym but I think that's not what strength and conditioning for endurance purposes is we're never looking to max you out because the the triathlon training or your endurance training is always going to be king it's always going to be the top dog and we're looking to support you alongside that um and that's where we want to be encouraging it season round so that we don't lose those adaptations and those gains that you make because yeah if we if we don't use it then we really do lose it sort of um yeah it. yeah definitely and then is, it, is there any advice you'd give to kind of coaches out there at the moment in terms of this line of thing and increasing knowledge potentially and and how they can help integrate s and c within their within their clubs if you like yeah, I think um, it can be done really cleverly. So obviously now in the online sphere, you can create that th- there's applicate well there's applications that you can be part of, and you can give the exercises. Your athletes can record videos of them executing the movement patterns, um, which really then you can see them in in motion, and you might be like, oh yeah, I can identify that as a as a strength or a weakness in in their performance. Um, you could do the built to endure courses for strength and condition and education, of course. Um, and um, yeah, so it's just and reading up on it, being more open minded, I think. So yeah, not just yeah. seeing it as something that you throw in every three months in every year in the winter because the weather's bad, but seeing it as actually this is going to take my athlete even further. This is this is going to improve their longevity in the sport, regardless if they're recreational and they're doing yep. it for fun. Yep. They're still chasing their PB. They're still chasing yep. their what they want in the sport, equal to somebody who's you know really high up there, maybe looking to make the bridge between pro and you know semi-pro or recreational. But, but then, what can they? What what's missing? What's that performance enhancer legal ones that are missing and that's from the conditioning a lot of that is the fact that you're giving them a different stimulus you're challenging their neuromuscular system in such a different way that if we go on the bike and we do 90 rpm for an hour you're doing 90 times 60 what's that yeah 400 (laughs) so 400 i think repetitions of the pedal in comparison to um you know going in once you get there going in the gym and doing potentially three sets of eight squats or goblet squats yep. it's a completely different stimulus, stimulus and the body yep. can respond to that and it's going to just take your athletes further and further and further no that's great emma thanks so much for your time there it's great to get your insight and your input and appreciate you joining Thank us you today on this series yeah <laughs> no, yeah great yeah great thanks emma appreciate your time Thank you, Chris.